In this video, we're going to look at the mythologies coming out of what's just kind of broadly called the Middle East. Now, just using the term the Middle East to refer to you know, this, this group of mythologies is like saying, uh, we're going to look at the cultures of North America. Right? Well, you've got a pretty wide spectrum there. Now, Mes we're going to start with Mesopotamia. Now, Mesopotamia is an area uh, between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. For the south of Mesopotamia is Samaria. And uh, for the north of Samaria is a city called Babylon. Now the peoples of Babylon conquered Samaria. And then that region collectively with Babylon and Samaria was collectively referred to as Babylonia. And then for the north you had the Assyrians. And the Assyrians conquered Babylonia. Now what we're going to find, so we're going to start with yeah, and then all this is referred to as Mesopotamia. So Mesopotamia have Assyria, uh, Babylon, uh, Babylonia, uh, Babylon, and then uh, Sumeria. Now these, like I said, these uh, uh, this is referred to as Mesopotamia, and the mythologies coming out of Mesopotamia really influenced the areas around Mesopotamia, and and. and we're, we're going to see this when we take a look at Persian mythology. Now Persia is not a part of uh, Babylonian mythology, but uh, uh, I think at one time it was conquered by Persia. You know, about Mesopotamia was conquered by Persia. So, um, and what happens when you have this conquering is, believe it or not, the yeah, you might think that when one region conquers another, the uh, culture of the second region, the conquered region, is just wiped out. Well, that doesn't look like what, that's what happens. Instead, the uh, mythology, the cultures are absorbed by the conquering nation. Now, even though there's absorption, there's still going to be some uh, tension, some changes. And we're going to see this probably most notably with Sumeria and Babylon. Sumerian mythology is a little different than Babylon, than Babylon mythology, the mythology out of Babylon. And then this in turn makes Babylonian mythology different. Uh, so, uh, with that in mind, let's take a look at this, you know, so at least some of the things that happen in this chapter are just broadly called the Middle East. So, this difference between Sumerian mythology and Babylonian mythology might It'll be most easily seen with their creation myths. Right? So let's start with Sumerian mythology. So for Sumerian mythology, everything comes from this primordial sea. Right? Primordial sea, Namu. Yeah, the primordial sea. And from the primordial sea come uh, the earth and the sky. Right? The god uh, An and the goddess Ki. Now, the earth and the sky give birth to uh, 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 Anlil. He's the creator god. He's the god of order, god of the universe. And Anlil not only creates uh, all you know all things, right? But he also gives agriculture. He also creates uh, tools, uh, the arts of civilization, vegetation, cattle. You might look at this and say, well, yeah, this guy's responsible for our existence. And that's true. Our Unleal not only uh, creates all these things, he creates humankind. And humankind is here to serve uh, the gods. So Nemo, An, Ki, and Unleal. And similar to uh, Unleal, and I'm not sure if he's necessarily supposed to be different, right? but um, there's a, than, than Unleal, but here we have this description of uh, another god called Anki. And Anki is, uh, he lives in the, you know, the underground sea. Again, whether that's supposed to be different from the primordial sea, I don't really know. Now, Anki lives in the underground sea, and he possesses the me. The, uh, these laws are immutable divine decrees on how to, well, do everything. <laughs> um, and you know, there's lots of these, I think there's something around 100 of these laws, these defined decrees, and they, they range from anywhere. The text doesn't go too much into this description. But they range from you know, defining what it means to be a law, defining what it means to be a god, defining uh, what 
worship should look like, uh, the different roles that people should take, what it means to be a king, and uh, how to uh, run economies, even down to, to you know rules and description, how to create certain musical instruments. Right? The me, these immutable divine decrees, tell you how to live and order your life. So this is this is the Sumerian mythology. Out of the primordial sea comes order, and order uh, organizes and creates and gives life to everything. So on the one hand, we've got the Sumerian mythology, the Sumerian creation myth. On the other hand, we have the Babylonian creation myth. And a Babylonian creation myth is a little bit different. Instead of one sea, right, one primordial sea, Namun, we've got two, Apsu and Tiamat. Uh, Apsu is the sweet water ocean. We might maybe also interpret this to be freshwater ocean. I, I don't know exactly what, it, what it's supposed to be. But a sweet water ocean. And the other hand, we have the salt water that's Tiamat. Now, Tiamat and Apsu come together to, uh, and, and you know, they come together, and through their union, they create two more gods, Anu and Ia. Right? And these are very, very powerful gods, Anu and Ia. Anu and Ia give birth to Marduk. And Marduk is the king of Babylon. So, got Apsu, Tiamat, Anu, Ia, and Marduk. All right, it's a lot of names here. So uh, the book doesn't really go into detail, and we may not know, but a conflict arises. And in the midst of this conflict, uh, Ia kills Absu. And so a child kills a parent. And because uh, Ia kills Absu, Tiamat, right, Tiamat, the saltwater ocean, the saltwater, uh, swears revenge. Now, to carry out her revenge, Tiamat creates monsters. And at the head of this army of mom monsters is her son, Kingu. So, Kingu is this kind of head head of the monsters, leading the monsters, and fighting uh, uh, the other gods. Now, uh, this fight is going nowhere, right? Uh, nobody is apparently winning, and there's just more and more destruction. So to settle the fight, Marduk says that he can settle, he can kill Tiamat, he can defeat Tiamat, but if he's going to defeat Tiamat, he wants something in return. And namely, right, he wants to be king of the gods. So uh, the other gods agree, and Marduk goes off and kills Tiamat. And, and when he kills her, he severs her body in two. And one part of the body makes the sky, and the other part of the body makes the earth. Then he confronts Kingu, and takes away from Kingu the Tablets of Destiny. And the Tablets of Destiny are pretty much like the me. Right? They're these divine decrees. And everybody wants these divine decrees, because they can now control everything else. Right? They have absolute power if they have the divine decrees. So, uh, Marduk defeats King, or takes away the Tablets of Destiny from Kingu, and then on top of that, he kills Kingu. Uh, now, with Kingu's death, right, he takes Kingu's blood, mixes it with Earth, and creates humankind. And once again, we're here to serve the gods. So it's a pretty different version from the Sumerians. So let's compare these two mythologies here, briefly. Uh, they teach <laughs> two very different lessons. You know, for the Sumerians, right, the, the universe is order. Right? The universe was brought about through order. Creation was brought about through order. Right? Uh, the gods are ordered. Uh, your place in the universe, I mean, you're here to serve, true, but you're here to serve through order. You're here to fill your place in the universe. Right? And you were brought about as you were created as an extension of that order. For the Babylonians, creation comes about through conflict. 
the conflict with the in the beginning with the gods, and through that conflict, through that death and destruction, we exist. And you were brought into existence by one who ascended to the throne by defeating an enemy. Descended to the throne, ascended to the throne by defeating an enemy. And for the Sumerians, life is mysterious. Sure, there's mysterious forces out there, but at least it's orderly. For the Babylonians, <laughs> life is mysterious because you know whatever happens happens because of some whatever whim of the gods, whatever whim of the one who conquers. And for the Sumerians, you are here as part of the order of the universe. For the Babylonians, you are here because you brought into existence by the one who conquers and made you a servant. In Sumerian mythology, right, what do we have? We have this idea that the universe is ordered. We have some notion that uh, the immutable divine decrees, uh, uh, even though they can be you know, captured by one god or the other, still determine what the universe is supposed to be like. For the Babylonians, you know, the universe is a you know kind of a capricious place. It's got its own wild whims because the gods that are controlled us are a little bit on the wild side. And, and you know, one epic, one you know, legend kind of exemplifies this, and that's the legend of Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh is uh, Gilgamesh is an important epic in Babylonian mythology, true. But Gilgamesh is also kind of a mess. <laughs> we might just call him Gilgamesh. <laughs> um, yeah, he's a. If Gilgamesh were to you know around today, he'd be what uh, uh, at once a uh, WWMA star, right? He's a you know, wrestling sensation, but at the same time, he also leads a rock and roll band <laughs> and president of the country. That, that's what Gilgamesh would be. So uh, you know, he, he's grandiose. He's larger than life. He's two-thirds God and one-third man. Not even half and half, but two-thirds God and one-third man. Presumably the one-third man part is his own mortality. He could be killed. So uh, he's <laughs> he's this huge, larger-than-life person. You know, he's a king, and he's pretty much... You know, we would say he's oppressing the people. He's probably, he'd probably say, I'm just being a king, right? He's doing what he wants, and he's living life, and he's being large and in charge, right? Uh, so to kind of put Gilgamesh in his place, the gods send Enkidnu. Enkidnu, and Enkidnu is kind of this wild, savage man. And Enkidnu is, is supposed to go and, and defeat and kill Gilgamesh. So what happens is the two fight, and then they become friends, Right, Gilgamesh makes him his buddy, and then they start going off and have all kinds of wild adventures together. They offend the gods even more, and including at one point, right, this, this goddess uh, wants to uh, have Gilgamesh as a consort, and he says, "No, thank you. I don't need you." Right? <laughs> he spurns this goddess. Right? How large? How large a person can he be? Ah, pff, the love of a goddess. What is that? <laughs> so Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Uh, uh, you know, or, or even having these large, you know, having even more grand adventures than, than Gilgamesh all by himself. So, now since Gilgamesh spurned the love of a goddess, right, what the result is is that uh, Enkidu dies, right? Enkidu is killed by the goddess. Um, and this sends you know, Gilgamesh into kind of a depression. You know, he misses his friend. So he tries very hard, he takes on, he goes on further adventures, he tries very hard to uh, get immortality for his friend Echidnu. And in a way, he kind of succeeds, right? He, he finally acquires uh, the secret to this immortal life, or to bring, to, or at least to bring back his friend Echidnu. And then he loses it. <laughs> um, and in the midst of all this, you know, he, 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 the lesson we're supposed to learn in all this is that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how larger than life a person you are, it doesn't matter how powerful you are or how big you are, or, you know, to the extent to which you uh, have and can spurn the gods, right? Because this is what Gilgamesh does. He never suffers death, but you know, his friend does. Uh, <laughs> no matter how grand and outrageous your life is, searching for immortality is in vain. You're never going to seek it. You're always going to die. Death is inevitable. And, and, 
that's kind of sad, right? I mean, you can rise to the top. And nobody could be bigger, no human could be bigger than Gilgamesh, but you're still going to die. Your life is not in your control. So we looked at the Sumerian mythology and the Babylonian mythology. Let's drift on over to Persian mythology. Now the Persians are even somewhat different than the Sumerians and the Babylonians. I might even say it's kind of a synthesis of the two. So we, you have Sumerians on the one hand who think the universe is inherently ordered, right? There's a reason for existence. There's uh, uh, something important and a meaning to your life. It's from this divine decree, the immutable me. Uh, that's the Sumerian. On the other hand, you have Babylonian mythology says, look, <laughs> there ain't a whole lot that's in your control. What happens in life is up to the whims of the gods. And, you know, it's not like they're really nice guys. They're a bunch of, you know, they're killing each other and, and having all kinds of fights of their own. And then you have Persian mythology. Now, Persian mythology views creation. And they don't. We, at least we don't have a creation story here. Maybe they just borrow from the previous ones. But uh, there's two supreme, uh, uh, like gods involved. One is Ahura Mazda, right? The Ahura Mazda, and this is you know the wise lord. This is the supreme god. Right? And Ahura Mazda, yeah, he's basically a, a good person. He's, he's responsible for life. He brings, he brings about uh, life in the universe. He brings about order again to the universe. It kind of sounds a little bit, you know, uh, uh, like in Leo or Anki. Uh, and kind of in opposition to uh, uh, Ahura Mazda is Angra Manu, or Menu, Angra Menu. And this is, he's a lord of it was a darkness and sterility. Right? <laughs> darkness and sterility. That, that's awful, right? Not only are you in the dark, you're, you're sterile. And Angra Mainyu is continually fighting against uh, uh, Ahura Mazda. And it's pretty much an even match. Right? It's, not, it's not as if Ahura Mazda could just snap his fingers and get rid of Angra Mainyu. Right? It always seems like Angra Mainyu has some resources. Uh, to call upon, to continue this fight. But this is what existence is, is this battle between good and evil. And while good will win, right? so the Persian mythology says good will win, it's not going to be an easy fight. It's not going to be an easy fight. So uh, one way to think about uh, this, it, it, what Persians might be doing here, is that they're, they're saying, look, Yes, there's order and wonder and beauty and life to the universe, but there's also this horrible disorder. There's also this uh, uh, death and sterility and, and, uh, going on. And these two are fighting each other. And we're kind of caught in the middle. We're kind of caught in the middle. So, so you can kind of see how Sumerian mythology influenced Babylonian mythology, and those two in turn influenced Persian mythology. 